I'm disappointed with some aspects of civilization. <laughs> One of them is our unending urge to bypass subtlety of character, thought, expression, and just categorize people. You're this or you're that. Do you realize what that does? It minimizes how much thought you have to put into it. It's lazy. It's intellectually lazy. Are you, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you this? Are you heterosexual? Are you homosexual? Are you, first of all, why do you even give a shit? Okay, first of all. Uh, second, if you want to understand who and what a person is, have a conversation with them. Don't step back and say, give me the one word label that is you. Now I'll claim I know everything there is to know about you because I've just labeled you as such. Because that label comes with a portfolio of what you should be if you are that label. I don't play that. I don't, you know, there's one label I'll take. I'm a scientist. That's the only label I will embrace. That says a lot about my, how my brain is wired, how I think, my curiosity, my wonder. Beyond that, leave labels out. Left brain, light, I'm, I, I'm brained, okay? <laughs> <laughs> how about that? I'm brained. Not left brain, right brain, I have a brain. And when I want to judge what it is I can accomplish, I don't look at my ancestors and say, oh, I have an ancestor who was this, who was an engineer, or this, or that, therefore I can be. We are all genetically related. Every human being on, any two humans on earth have a common ancestor if you go back far enough in the family tree. So the fact that you draw a circle that's this big around family, say that's my family, and outside the circle it's not, that's an arbitrary circle. That's biologically arbitrary. You've decided for yourself that inside the circle is my family, outside it's not. When we have genetic links among all human beings. So what I do is I look to see what have human beings accomplished? What poetry has been written by Keats or Browning? What, what novels have been written? What speeches have been given? What discoveries have been made? And that's what I use as my reference for what I am capable of as a human being. Don't call me left brain, right brain. Call me a human. Can I just ask you, I just, two Elon Musk questions. Any chance we're living in a simulation, as he's described? Yeah, I think... Uh, this, this idea came right. forth back in, in the 1990s as a philosopher, forgive me, I, I've forgotten his name, uh, who thought it, as computing power grows, we can create worlds in a computer. Wait a right. second, like we're living in the matrix? I'm getting there. I, I, I got this. I, <laughs> right, right. You get I, right. I got this. So, so if you have it's tremendous computing power, you can simulate every possible thing that could occur, right. including the neurosynaptic sure. firings in the characters that you create. So in that sense, why... What's to stop you from thinking that the characters you created are themselves real? Now, if you've created this world and the world has built into it a kind of pseudo free will, maybe those characters will say, I want to create a simulation. So then they create simulations right. within the simulations. Step back and ask, how many total simulations are there? How many total worlds are there out there? There's only one real world and everything else is a simulation. Which are you more likely to be so in? I'm in the real world. <laughs> How do you describe what you do? Professionally, I'm an astrophysicist. You are an astrophysicist, and yeah. you have the vest to prove it. Thank you. It, it Thank underlines you. what it is that you do, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about. Because you, know, you know something? What? Underline is simply the typesetter's instruction for italics. I didn't know that. Yes, that's all. That's why you never see anything underlined in a newspaper. It's just italic. It's a weird leftover curiosity of the transition from typewriter to computer when all you had was a typewriter communicating with typesetters. But see, this is what makes you so fascinating. You kind of know about everything. You are... No, no. You are... Okay, wait. I want right. to talk about what I know, and make, that might sound like everything, but there's a whole lot of stuff I don't know. No, but you know a whole lot of cool stuff. You know Did why you know I know that? a lot of cool stuff? Why? Because when I'm with someone, mm -hmm. and they ask me about the universe, I say I'm not interested in the universe, because I already know about it. I want to find out what you do. Okay. And then I learn about what people do. I don't grow up and only ever talk about the universe. Well, so let's talk about that. You have a, a huge appetite for being intellectually curious. Oh, yeah. Where did that come from? Uh, well, it, it's, it is contained within any adult who has not 
grown up. So you're still a big child. I'm still a kid. And I think that's true for most, if not every single person who carries scientist as a title. Because what does a kid do? A kid turns over rocks and explores and pokes things. And it takes foresight for an adult to allow that, recognizing that these explorations that usually end up in stuff that's broken are actually experiments on the forces of nature that surround us. Kids don't worry about the weather. Oh, it's raining. Let's go out and get wet. No, you'll get your clothes dirty. Oh, there's a mud puddle there. Let me jump into it with two feet. No, everything is a no. Every time it's snowing outside, now I have to remind myself, but I do open my mouth and catch snowflakes in it. Just like kids. I, it's a reminder of what I don't want to lose as I get older. Because that is an inherent state of curiosity that I think we're born with and just get it beaten out of us because it's not mature to jump two feet into puddles. So how did you not get this beaten out of you? What did your parents do right? Uh, so, well, my parents are not scientists. Uh, my mother was a housewife, a common profession of the day. And my father was a practicing sort of sociologist. Meanwhile, here's their son, the astrophysicist, which I knew I wanted to be since age 11. Many parents want their kids to be what they are or want their kids to be what they tried to be and never were. None of that went on in my household. So they saw what I was interested in, that of my siblings, and they nurtured that. You said you knew what you wanted to do since you were 11. Oh, were... Actually, since age 9. Since I was 11, I was able to assign a job title to it. So what was it at 9? That Do you remember the sort of a focal oh, yeah. moment? At age 9, first encounter with a planetarium sky at my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium mm -hmm. here in New York City. So Where you are now director, I'd like to point out. Yeah, yes, which I'm is now pretty darn cool. Director, you know, you go in and you, these big, com comfortable chairs, and they recline or they lean far back, and then they turn out the lights, and the stars come out. And I thought it was a hoax. Oh was yeah, it? it was a hoax because I had I knew the night sky from the Bronx where I grew up. The sky had nine stars in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and this had thousands, countless thousands. Yeah, of course. Later, I would know that it was the real sky and. From then on, the universe called me, and I, in retrospect, I think perhaps had no say in the matter. It was just what you were meant to do. Yeah, and so I've been thinking about the universe ever since. And who are your heroes in your field? Yeah, uh, I'm not very hero-driven or role model-driven. In fact, I think role model is overrated. In fact, I think it's a bad concept. Typically, a role model is someone who resembles your profile in some fundamental way and you want to follow their steps to become what they are. Okay, so there I am at age 11 in 1969 and I'm going to find a black astrophysicist who grew up in the Bronx. No! <laughs> there aren't any! So am I going to limit my options in life because maybe I'm going to do something where I'm the first? No! The problem with role models today is you have these athletic role models and then they, they have steroids or drugs or whatever. And then the people who put them up as role models then worry that the kids who saw them as role models now want to do drugs. That's just, that's, no, no. If you like their athletics, like their athletics. Carve that out and put it there and reach for that. Don't be the rest of what they are. Who knows what the rest of what they are is? So you are author, astrophysicist, yes. educator, yes. still an athlete, it looks like, uh, well, <laughs> and parent, and morally responsible parent. parent. I'd, I'd like to think so, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, it's every, maintaining all that is always a challenge, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're all human. But that doesn't mean the goals can't stand there in front of you and where you want to reach for it every day. Now, when you talk about these things, somebody in the audience must come up, I assume, and say, well, oh, we only understand 4% of this stuff. Yeah, right? that's great. So how I love that, it. <laughs> how, how is that different from Bill O'Reilly saying, well, in that case, the rest of it's gone. We, you, you guys are just, you're just expounding beliefs here. You've got no evidence <laughs> the for the 96%. The difference is... We do understand the tides. <laughs> the tides are part of the 4% we understand. So Bill O'Reilly is giving a list of things that are fully understood. If he had given a list of things that are not understood, okay, that would be a different reaction. 
and it would be less susceptible to comedic mockery than saying, tides come in and out, you can't explain that. It's like, yes, we can. We've known that one for the last couple of hundred years. Give me a better example. So if he said, there's dark matter and there's, there's dark energy forcing an expansion of the universe so fast that it's accelerating, you can't explain that. Right. We can't explain it. <laughs> okay. I don't think he knows enough physics to be able to tell us what it is we don't understand yet. That would have been a more interesting exchange with the atheist guy. I, I, for, I forgot his name, forgive me, but the guy who, who, who he was interviewing. Now, if he wants to use that as evidence for God, but then we just have to come back and say, well, doesn't mean if you don't understand it, something and the community of physicists don't understand it, and stand it that means God did it? Is that, is that how you want to play this game? Because if it is... Here's a list of the things in the past that the physicist at the time didn't understand. And a talk show you might have conducted 200 years ago would have said, the planets do retrograde? Can't understand that. Must be a god. And we'd say, you know, you're right. And then 10 years later, we understand it. So what do you do? So you're, if, that's how, if that's how you want to invoke your evidence for God, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. So just be ready for that to happen if that's how you want to come at the problem. So that's just simply the God of the gaps argument. It's been around forever. So in fact, people who want to make arguments... And by the way, wait, 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 and I don't, I don't even mind, I don't even care if someone wants to say, you don't understand that, God did it. I, that doesn't even bother me. What would bother me is if you were so content in that answer that you no longer had curiosity to learn how it happened. If you, the day you stop looking because you're content God did it, I don't need you in the lab. You're useless on the frontier of understanding the nature of the world. And if the world had been... If... if I'm glad whoever those folks are there aren't that many of them, because if they dominated the world, we'd still be in the cave. We would have never left the cave, because there are mysterious things out there, and you know, God is doing that, and you don't need to know that, and don't even think about it. Where would we be if their understanding of the world ruled the world? So I don't mind it, but just don't prevent others from uh, conducting that investigation themselves. Yeah. So he could, have made a, <clears throat> he could have made a better case if he'd had an astrophysicist as a consultant advising him. <laughs> he would have made a different case. Find some physics we don't understand, and if he wants to call that God... No, then you come at him with the God of the gaps argument. But uh, you don't pick something that we can understand, because then you're just the object of mockery. How have you conducted yourself as a parent, then, as the father of two children? and trying to take what you stitched together and then what your parents obviously gave you in such a wonderful way. Oh, so I take some of those lessons that I value and... You know what's interesting? Hmm. Well, what I think is interesting. Their parents... I'm describing a stereotyped case, possibly even a caricature, but we've all heard it and we'll all understand it when I say it. You get someone who's perhaps born in poverty or born under very hard times, and they struggle, and they do anything they can to make just a buck, and then they finally succeed, and they're actually wealthy, and they want to have a family, and they have kids, and they say to themselves, I don't want my kids to struggle the way I did. That person forgets to recognize or does not realize that they became who they are because of those challenges. Not in spite of them, but because of them. And if you become what you are because of them and you want a next generation to achieve the same, then you gotta put challenges out there. I'm not saying starve your kids the way you had to, but there are other ways you can put the challenges in front of them. How does your mind work? Oh, what I found, I remember walking to a library one day and doing the math. Oh, it was a big library that I did this in. And I said, well, at what rate am I reading books? That's a number. We write it down. How many books are there? 
Okay? If you divide the total number of books by the rate at which you read the books, out the other side comes a time. And that's the total time it will take you to read every single book. And for the library I happened to be standing in front of, it was multiple lifetimes. And that was a depressing moment. It meant I wouldn't know everything that was ever written. So I said, well, there are these little things I can read. I can read about this and that. And when you start this, you wonder, will it ever sum to anything? But as I kept learning, I reached a point where all of a sudden, pathways began to connect them. Well, this only happened because this series of events happened before it. And that happened because this happened at the same time. All of this fragmented knowledge became understanding and wisdom. And I like to think it's still growing. Only if you keep learning does this, can this ever possibly happen to you. If you just said, I, don't, I only need to know this because that's for my job and I don't need to know anything else and I won't, then you have sort of linear knowledge. My most cherished emails that I get are from people who got into a fight at the bar over how black holes will kill you or <laughs> of the fate of our galaxy or what will be the, the thermodynamic death of the future of the universe. I love that. So when a child sings or used to sing, I don't think they do anymore, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, it's not twinkling. Something powerful, dramatic, and dynamic is happening to it, right? <laughs> well, yes, and we call that twinkling. Yeah, so, right. yeah, there's starlight coming billions of, uh, or millions of light years, well, it depends if it's a gal, but hundreds of thousands of light years across space, and it's a perfect point of light as it hits our atmosphere. Turbulence in the atmosphere jiggle the image, and it renders the star a twinkling. And by the way, Planets are brighter than stars, typically, like Jupiter and, and Venus. Venus has been in the evening skies lately. And uh, if you go twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, and you, w I want, you want to wish upon the star, most people are wishing on planets. <laughs> right. That's why the wishes don't come true. <laughs> the planets are the first stars to come out at night. Don't you sometimes feel... Uh, sad about breaking all these myths apart. <laughs> no, no, because I, I, I think it's, uh, some myths are, are, are deserve to be broken apart out of respect for the human intellect. That, um, no, when you're writhing on the ground and froth is coming out of your mouth, you're having an epileptic seizure. You have not been invaded by the devil. We got this one figured out, okay? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> discovery moves on. So I, I don't mind the power of myth and magic, and, but take it to the next frontier and apply it there. Don't apply it in places where we've long passed what we already know what's going on. I came out of the planetarium, and that evening I sat thinking about what you said in the show about you acknowledged the Big Bang, and you, and I remember that, Hubble rewound the process mathematically, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, and calculated that everything, matter, space, energy, even time itself, actually had a beginning. So it turns out that it was not Hubble, although Hubble had the data that enabled the calculation. The person who did that was a Belgian priest, George Lemaitre. He's a, he's a priest, physicist, physicist priest, right. okay? What a cool thing to have on your <laughs> business card. Yeah. You, got every, you got people coming and going with that. But uh, he calculated what the implications of Einstein's general relativity, which was the new theory of gravity, would be with Hubble's expanding universe. And he says the whole universe may have begun in a singular point in the past. And thus, uh, Big Bang, as a phrase, was used pejoratively of this idea, but it stuck. An incredible flash of energy and light, though. And matter and, yeah, all of this, all of the above. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence that there will be fruitful 
things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. To so even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally. They meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. I have known serious religious people, not fundamentalists, who were scared when Carl Sagan opened his series with the words, The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. And that scared them because they interpret that to mean that if this is it, there's nothing else, no God and no life after. For, for religious people, many people say, well, God is within you. or yeah. God, th There are ways that people have shaped this rather than God is an old gray-bearded man in the clouds. So if God is within you, what I'm sure Carl would say, in, in you, in your mind, in your mind, and we can measure the neurosynaptic firings when you have a religious experience. We can tell you where that's happening, when it's happening, what you're feeling like at the time. So your mind, of course, is still within the cosmos. But do you have any sympathy for people who seem to feel, only feel safe in the vastness of the universe you describe in your show if they can infer a personal God who makes it more hospitable to them, who cares for them? In this, uh, what we tell ourselves is a free country, which means you should have freedom of thought. It, I don't care what you think. I just don't. Go think whatever you want. Go ahead. Think that there's one God, two gods, ten gods, or no gods. That is what it means to live in a free country. The problem arises is if you have a religious philosophy that is not based in objective realities that you then want to put in the science classroom. Then I'm going to stand there and say, no, I'm not going to allow you in the science classroom. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just telling you in the science class, you're not doing science. This is not science. Keep it out. That's where I, that's when I stand up. Otherwise, go ahead. I, I, I'm not telling you how to think. I think you must realize that some people are going to go to your show at the planetarium and they're going to say, aha, those scientists have discovered God because God, dark matter, is what holds this universe together. So is that a question? <laughs> it's a statement. You know, you know they're going to so, say that. So the history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert 
that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't, can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, 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 he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. It was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery. And in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God. If God is the mystery of the universe. These mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one if you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation god has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread so to the person who says maybe dark matter is god if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery then get ready to have that undone go up by another factor of a thousand you get to a billion Carl Sagan's favorite number. In fact, if you bring your chin out and say the word billion, it sounds beautiful. We'll do it together on three. Ready? First, stick your chin out. Okay, one, two, three, billion. Oh, isn't that beautiful? That's just beautiful. <laughs> That's just beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Billion. That's a fun number. Anyone here 31 years old? Raise your hand. Got to be a few of you. Very nice. In this year of your life, you will live your billionth second. Um, yes, I'm geeky enough to have calculated this. <laughs> 31 years, 259 days, 1 hour, 46 minutes, and 40 seconds. But you have to account for leap days and leap seconds, okay? I'm going to try to make an app that'll do this, but I haven't done it yet. I've been busy doing other things. But I celebrated my own billionth second with a really small glass of champagne. Uh, <laughs> uh, 50 of these billions... Uh, let's see, I think a neighbor of yours, uh, is, he's a neighbor, right? Isn't he? He's like, you see him around town, I presume? <laughs> Not, okay. Uh, his his well, net worth is like $50 billion, plus or minus. I don't know if you know how much that is. I, I don't believe you know. You don't. In fact, I'm certain you don't, because I'm going to tell you. I will tell you how rich this man is. First of all, it's, I'm, I'm charmed by the fact that the patron saint of geeks is the richest man in the world. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a different world than it was when the richest people were sort of oil barons and steel barons. 